Well, let's dive back into our topic here of raising screen time kids. We've talked about five core principles up to this moment, and now we're going to dive into the sixth section and the sixth core principle related to raising healthy screen time kids. We're going to start off by talking about setting healthy boundaries with screens. This second part of our time together is going to be addressing boundaries. It's going to be addressing guidelines, rules, and how to have conversations about healthy habits related to devices with our kids. Uh, So let's talk about core principle number six. You should see it there in your outline. It says this, a primary responsibility of parents in this digital age is to help their children develop healthy boundaries with screens. I alluded to this in our last section. Our parents didn't have to think about how do I help my kid have healthy boundaries with screens. Probably at least not the whole of our childhood. There wasn't much focus on screens. Now, in the day and age we live in, it is actually a primary opportunity. And we won't see it as an obstacle. We talked about that last time. Uh, maybe it is a duty, but it is an opportunity for us. What does healthy look like? Let's start getting real practical here. What does healthy look like? The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends no more than one hour of screen time a day for children between 18 months and five years old. Okay, so we're going to break this down by age. 18 months to five years old. Before 18 months, they don't recommend that there should be much screen time at all, though I will be honest, even my one-year-old, as I've shared, loves Coca Melon and a show every once in a while to calm them down. But it's not a regular practice. As they're in those earlier years of development, they shouldn't be focusing a lot on a screen. Then they go into their elementary years, and everything starts increasing only by half or quarter hours. So then you start into the, the early elementary years, you're an hour and a quarter or an hour and a half. And then you start into the, uh, the junior high years, you're up to maybe two hours a day of screen time. And the high school years is not much beyond that. It's only about two and a half hours is the recommended amount of time on screens outside of the responsibilities that they have with school. So they're going to have screen time at school. They're going to be exposed to screens. It's part of what they do. But there should not be excessive amounts of screen outside of school, no more than two to two and a half hours, even through the the teenage years. Now, this includes all types of screens. This is devices. It is laptops. It is phones. But it also includes uh, screens like TV, televisions and, and shows that they're watching. I saw a funny tweet of somebody just today that said, I took my screen away from my kid, and so we went to see a movie. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's, that's not the intent there. There should be some detoxing from screens. Now, there's things like the American Academy of Pediatrics out there. There's other articles. You can find all sorts of things telling you what type of screens, uh, time, what type of screen time a kid should have, how much they should have. Really, it's up to you and you knowing your child. My assistant said to me this this last week. Uh, she knows, obviously, about the book that I've written. She said, my daughter's been home with strep throat. I have to work. I'm breaking every rule in your book. She's lived on a screen every day, all day, just to get through my working hours. Uh, She knew that that was right. She knew she was going to have to do some detox. She said, after this, I know we're going to have to do a whole week of weaning back to what is normal. You know your kids. You know what you need. You know what they need. And you know when too much is too much. So really, the best rule of thumb is for you to know what's best for my kid. I can tell you, my kids are all different. I have six kids. Yes, I know that's a lot. I have these six different children, and all of them have different amounts of screen time that they can handle before they change. For Charlie, my four-year-old, it's not much screen time. If he has more than even just a half hour, he changes. He, he's erratic in his behavior. He's demanding. He's crying about the craziest things, right? Whereas maybe my older kids, my eight-year-old, she can handle a good amount of screen time. And when I say it's time to hand it over, she hands it over and she's okay. She's fine and can proceed on with normal activity. I know my children. You must know your children and the boundaries that should be set for each and every one of them. What's right for them? You know it by watching their behavior, watching their addiction level, which we're going to talk more about screen time addiction here in a moment, knowing when they're too engrossed in it and when they can actually pull back. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. But let's identify this idea of boundaries. 
Uh, boundaries is a popular term, especially in the Christian psychological world, psychology world. We should have boundaries. And it's not all bad, but I would rather talk about biblical boundaries. What is biblical boundaries? What are they and, and how do they work? Here's how I would define biblical boundaries. Boundaries uh, are not always about protecting from outside threats, but they can also be about cherishing what we already possess. A passage that would be helpful for you to think about is Psalm 16. David says, Your boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. That's a statement about boundaries, but it's not just protection from outside threats. What David's saying is what you have given me, what I possess, is worth protecting. That is true for your children as well. We're protecting them from outside threats, but we're also we're cherishing and nurturing the way that God has made them, the, the things that are bound up in their hearts that must be discipled further. Boundaries, when we set them and enforce them correctly, and should I say biblically, these boundaries should create freedom because they give kids space to make the best decisions for themselves and for the glory of God. Boundaries can sound harsh and uh, all about stop it or don't go there. But boundaries should be more about, honey, I love this part of you. I love this art skill that you have. I love this passion that you have. I love it when you play with Legos. I love it when you do that thing out in nature. I want these things to be expressed more. I'm cherishing the way God has made you. So I'm going to allow some of those things and I'm going to put boundaries on your screen time in order to allow the uniquenesses of God in you to flourish. You understand what I'm doing there? You're, you're helping them flourish in the way that they have been made. So examples of boundaries will be things like protecting what is unique to them, uh, helping develop something that they're uniquely passionate about. Uh, you see them passionate about nature. Great. Giving them opportunities to engage in things that are in nature. You see them have an aptitude in sports and specific things they want to continue to pursue outside of screens. Great. I want to help that continue to flourish. You want to be involved in church. You want to read this book. Whatever it may be, you're going to uh, protect those things and help those things flourish. But you're also going to teach them boundaries related to relationships. So another thing that is worth cherishing is our family relationships. Any relationship really is worth cherishing, but they live in the incubator of your home for a certain period of time, and they should be taught how to cherish those relationships. So a good example of a boundary then related to that would be no phones at the table. We do our best to do that. We don't always do that, but we do our very best to say no phones at the table. When we're at the table and we're having a, a family meal, it's conversation, no devices. That includes even Alexa who seems to have a permanent place in our dining room, right? We're having conversations and we don't know the answer. Hey, Alexa. And she just joins the table, right? She starts answering things. But doing our best to have real life human conversations without technology or devices. There are certain periods that we should be putting boundaries on in our life, time periods or settings. Another example of a boundary would be no phones in bedrooms. I'm a big advocate of this. I think it's a great thing to consider even for us as adults, but I think it's a great thing to be done for our kids as well. For us as adults, in that we can spend a lot of time on our devices, even in our bed, and the very first thing that we wake up to, because our alarm is on it, is our device, right? And we go dependent or used to always having our device around. A good boundary might be no phones in bedrooms. Bedrooms are for sleeping and not for connecting through technology. You could say a, a, a healthy boundary is only a certain amount of screen time per day. We've done this with our kids, and I expound upon this in detail within my book. We've, we've given them a certain allotment of screen time in the week, with screen time coupons. So they have a coupon for a device and then a coupon for a family show or a movie, two different types of currency that we've given them. That's because they can't contemplate, I'm going to only spend eight hours on screens this week. But they can contemplate, I only have 10 coupons, and I have to turn in a coupon every time I use a screen. Those kind of things are teaching them boundaries, limiting certain things so that other things can take place. I'll talk about that more a little bit later. Conversations. I think it's important for you to have boundaries with especially your teens or those who have devices saying, listen, when we're talking, eye contact's important. 
I'm going to teach you the importance of eye contact before you're out into the real world. So when we're talking device down, look me in the eyes. Another great rule might be no AirPods in a car, no, no devices in your ear. When we're together in a car, we're talking. It's not a time for you to be listening to something and not conversing with me. Again, those are example boundaries. They might be good for you to consider. You might have a different opinion, but it's saying there's going to be certain contexts or relationships where I will say there are boundaries for us and we're not going to cross those. When it comes to boundaries, it might be helpful with your kids to create a screen time contract. I've put this in your note, a couple tips related to it, but creating a screen time contract. What is a screen time contract? Well, let me back up and tell you, my dad wrote all sorts of contracts with me as a kid. In fact, I have a notebook in my keepsake box of every contract my dad wrote with me. What that was, was him making an agreement with me with a, a clear set of rules and a clear consequence, and we both had to sign it at the bottom. And literally, I have a whole notebook of these things. You can go to youth group if, and it had what things I had to get done, and what time I had to be home. And if I don't, then here's the consequence, and we would both sign the bottom of this. It was something he did with me over and over and over through my teen years. What he's doing was he was teaching me responsibility. He was teaching me to make wise decisions. The funny part is, is he would usually leave the consequent consequence section open for me to decide. So he'd be like, what do you think the consequence should be if you break this contract? And I was like, I don't know, grounded for three weeks. And he's like, wow, that's way more intense than I would have gone. But he's writing it as fast as he can, right? He's like, you said it, I didn't. Come on, sign here. And so we would agree on consequences, but also the boundaries. So what is a screen time contract? It's an agreed upon boundary. You're using the best that your child can reason with you about what the agreement is. You're agreeing upon it. You're saying, this is where we're going to go with this. This is how much screen time is going to be used. Or it might be a boundary related to no phones in bedrooms. Or it might be a boundary of no phones after 10 o'clock or whatever it may be. It's an agreed upon boundary. You're putting that in writing. You're outlining the consequence if that boundary is broken. You're being very clear. This is what will happen if you break that consequence. Listen, if you're giving boundaries without clarifying consequence, you're doing nothing but threatening parenting. You're threatening them. Don't you do this or else. Or else what? Clarify the what, right? You have to be clear about what the consequence will be if the boundary is broken. That should be in all areas of our life, but it can also tie here to screens. And then the period that this contract is in place. Uh, just like any other contract in our life, be it with our homes or the device contracts we signed for our devices or the carrier contracts we signed for our carriers, we have contracts. We understand the period of time that that contract covers. So our contract with our child should also be outlined how long this contract stays in place. And then if they're older and they can reason with this, I, I think signature or some kind of agreement from both parties is important. If you don't have them sign it, that's fine. You could just say, this is it. You're clear with that. I'm clear with that. It's going on the pantry door. It's going on the refrigerator door. We're, we're clear. We got this. Okay, that's clear. And you both agree upon it and you move forward. When it's broken, then the consequences are put in place. A woman in our church told me a story recently about her, her contract, if you will, with her teenage son. It was around no phones in bedrooms. And uh, call it mother in, mother's intuition, the Holy Spirit, whatever. She walked into her son's bedroom and she said, is your phone in here? And he looked at her plain faced and said, no, my phone's not in here. And all of a sudden his pillow started to glow and vibrate. <laughs> and she said, are you sure your phone's not in here? Actually, it is. And he pulled his phone out and he handed it over. They had agreed upon the consequence. The consequence was no phone for a week if you take it into your bedroom. He, he couldn't argue with it. He lost his phone for a week because they had an agreed upon consequence. It wasn't a fight. It wasn't a battle. He knew he broke it and they went on with the consequence. What consequences should we use if our kids break screen time rules? Well, I have a suggestion for you. The first and maybe clearest is you should take away the thing that is being abused, right? So if they break the contract with you uh, over something specific, it could be the device in general or something on the device that they're accessing, that thing is taken away. It is removed. Think about it this way. If you give your kid a knife and you say, be careful with this knife, don't do anything wrong with this knife, and they do something wrong with the knife, what are you going to do? You're going to take the knife away, right? Same with a baseball bat. Same with a gun, same with a sword, same with a weapon, same with anything that's destructive. 
In the same way, we should do that with our phones. If they cannot prove to be responsible with something, then you take it away from them until their behavior changes enough that you can let them try it again. I think it's important for you to, to, to set those boundaries up, those consequences up, and then do what you need to to pull those things back as needed. Now, I had a 15-year-old that I was counseling with his parents. We were working through all sorts of screen time addiction. Uh, this young man was extremely addicted to not only pornographic material, but other things. And his parents were very bothered by it. It started affecting their entire family, sisters included, mom included. Uh, so they had to start setting boundaries. But the problem was he had a school-issued laptop. And he would find ways around all of even the school-issued platforms to get access to things, even when sitting at the kitchen table. I mean, we tried everything, uh, behavior modification with this kid. We tried to sit him in the middle of the house, people with him all the time. It didn't matter. His grandpa would sit right next to him, and he would still access things he shouldn't be accessing. Finally, they had to go to the school's IT department and have a whole conversation. Also, the teacher saying, listen, we have to change some learning behaviors here. This kid is so addicted to certain things through his device that we must change how he has access to school's information. It's embarrassing. It was embarrassing for the kid. It was embarrassing for the adults. But it's worse to let the addiction go on. You might even have to talk to your school's IT department to get help with some of those addictions. Remember this when it comes to consequences and creating balance with our kids. The point of discipline with our kids is discipleship. We discipline our kids for discipleship. The point of discipline is discipleship. What is discipline from a biblical perspective? Discipline is the practice of punishing another person for their own benefit or maturity. That's why we discipline them. For the benefit of their own maturity, their Christ-likeness. We're not just trying to punish them for punishment's sake, but trying to grow them to be more Christ-like. I believe that a broken boundary is an opportunity for conversation about a heart matter. So if they break a boundary, don't just be so fuming mad, though you might be, and I have been, back up for a moment and realize this is an opportunity for you now to speak to their heart and to their motives. It's a discipleship opportunity. Helping your kids or your child develop healthy screen habits. Core principle number seven. If you teach your kid to use their screen in moderation when they are young, they will likely carry this life skill into adulthood. Think about that. If I can teach them to be balanced now, if I can give them healthy habits now, then they will likely take those kind of things into their adult years. This is where I speak of screen time currency in the book, chapter 7. I talk about the idea of helping them understand individual screen time versus full family screen time. We outlined for a summer uh, these coupons that each kid would get, the coupon for individual screen time. This included a laptop, a tablet, or even a game on a phone. They could turn in that coupon and have access for individual screen time. The coupon currency was 30 minutes at a time. Then they were each given a coupon to make a decision about a family show or a family movie. What I was doing there was trying to teach them to make a wise decision for our whole family. Now, the older kids got more currency because they had more access to screen time. They could do more on it, and they got more family screen time currency. I wanted them to make a decision for the family or for their younger siblings. They would then have all of their currency at the beginning of the week, I would give them all of their coupons at the beginning of the week and they could turn it in for screen time. Now, this is how it worked. My son, my son, in the first like 24 to 36 hours, he used all of his coupons. He just turned it all in, right? He, he just, he went right for it. And I was like, you understand this is like for the whole week, like you use all of this and it's gonna be gone. Yeah, I get it. And he just kept turning it in, okay? Uh, my, my 10 year old daughter, she, she was eight at the time, she, she saved them. Because I said, if you get to the end, I will actually give you real cold, hard cash and buy back these coupons from you. 50 cents, a dollar, whatever it was for the coupons. She saved them. That girl read books. She didn't go into the screens at all. My son tried to steal her coupons, tried to buy her coupons. I made a rule, no buying coupons. You couldn't trade coupons. But it was amazing to see how different they were and how they used their screen time currency. Now, they could earn 
screen time back. If they read for 30 minutes, then they would earn 30 minutes of screen time. So what I was doing is I was teaching them ways to have balance or moderation by using these different coupons. Again, I explain this more in depth in my book, but the allowances were given to the kids to teach them, to disciple them, what it meant to use the screen time in a healthy way. But it depended on their age and their maturity as to what I would give them. Uh, Healthy screen time habits is made up of several different things. These are listed in the notes for you. Healthy screen time habits are communicating healthy expectations. If I'm going to have healthy screen time habits in our home, I have to communicate healthy expectations. What I want them to be doing or not doing. How to have a balanced diet when it comes to screen time. If you've taken your kid for their annual checkup recently, you've probably had your pediatrician ask your child, how much time are you spending on your screen? Crazy. In the olden days, they would ask us about the food pyramid, right? How are you doing with your vegetables, right? How are you you getting enough protein? Now, our pediatrician even was asked, I sat there and watched uh, this woman ask our kids, how much time are you spending on screen? Mom and dad, how much time is your kids spending on screen? It's because even our doctors are worried about how much time our kids are on screens. We must teach them to have a balanced diet when it comes to screens, setting healthy expectations. We also must set aside time for them to unplug. It's important that they have a no to low technology time in their week for an extended period of time and no to low technology periods of their day. Now that's important for us. I think that's good for everybody, but it's important for them as well. Removing technology from bedrooms, I think that's a healthy practice, a healthy habit. Again, that's up to you, but I believe that's a healthy habit for screen time. Protecting your family time. We already spoke about this, but having no phones at the table or we do a family quiet time. Uh, so we'll sit on the couch on a Saturday morning and I literally will set a timer usually on a screen, right? Sometimes even our main TV screen, 25 minute countdown timer. We're all gonna read our Bibles. We're all gonna be still. We're gonna listen to some worship music. We're gonna just do our best to be still. Are they still for 25 minutes? <laughs> by no means. Like a whole pack of granola bars is gone by the end of the time. And they're up and they're beating up each other at certain times, but we're doing our best to have no technology for a period of time and even pursue the Lord or read the Bible. Seeking what feeds your soul. A healthy screen time habit is to find something that will feed the souls of our children. I will give my kids free time on certain apps. There are some apps I'm like, you can just keep going on that. The Bible app is a good example of that. Bible memory games. My daughter came to me the other night. I had already said, no screen time. Everybody's done. Focus on your homework. Don't ask me for my phone. I don't care if you need a calculator. You know, go find an old one, right? Just, just do what you needed. No screen. My daughter walks right up to me. Dad, can I use your Bible memory app on your phone that helps you memorize verses? Sure, babe, here it is. Just have it, right? I was like, I want her in the Word, and I was excited for her to have that. So there are some things where I will break rules because it's feeding their soul or feeding their mind with godly things. Turning off devices one hour before bed. I talk about this a couple times throughout the book, but I do think it's important for our kids to have space before they sleep. And this isn't just Pastor Josh's opinion, but this is the opinion of those who have studied the minds of child, the brains of child. Uh, It is important for them to have some time before they go to bed where they are away from the blue light of screens. They're away from the device. So turning off electronics before bedtime, encouraging them to have a calmer time, more thoughtful, more mindful, maybe meditating on scripture. That's very, very important for them. And oh, by the way, I think it's a good idea for parents as well. Just thought I'd sneak that in there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Paul didn't even have a device when he wrote this, but I think it's a great verse for us related to devices. Well, we could do all sorts of things with our devices. It's not that using our device for everything is beneficial because we will in the end be dominated. And Paul says, I will not be dominated by anything. Beginning to round the corner towards the end of our time together, let's talk about the chief end of raising screen time savvy kids. Core principle number eight is this. Every moment we use a screen is an opportunity to bring glory to the Lord. We talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whether we're eating or drinking, we're glorifying the Lord. We should be constantly working towards glorifying Him in whatever way possible. 
Now, the world will tell you you're going to be a good parent if you train your kid to be moral, to make wise decisions, to train them to be a positive contribution to society. But the Bible's role for parents is to teach them to love God above all things. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, where it talks about loving the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, the very next verse after that is to teach your children to do the same. As you walk along the road, as you lie down, as you get up, as you drive in a car, as you use a device, as you meet around the kitchen table, all of these things, they are opportunities for you to teach your child to love God. Parenting your child through a device-saturated world is far more than just parenting them through the obstacles of what's on a screen. It's about teaching them the chief end of knowing Christ and glorifying their Father in heaven. Our parenting must always have the long-term perspective in mind. My goal is that they know Christ. That's what I want them to have more than anything. I believe the greatest legacy I can leave in this life is raising kids that know God. It's not any books I write, sermons I preach, people I impact. It's my own children knowing and serving the Lord. And I want to glorify the Lord and teach my kids to do the same. So let me give you six God-glorifying benefits of teaching kids how to be screen time savvy. If you're investing in your kids the wisdom needed for them to make it through this device-saturated world, then you will be showing them these six things. First, you'll show them that good character stems from godly choices. Don't just teach them to be moral. Teach them to be godly. Teach them to glorify Christ. And you can use a screen and the opportunity of uh, working through moderation with the screen to teach them to make godly choices. You can also help your child while they're in their home develop a resistance or a pattern of resistance against temptation. I don't want my kids to walk around facing some of the temptations I've had to face. I want them to have less if possible. Yet I know, I'm not naive, to the fact that they're going to live in a world that probably has way more temptations than what I walked through. If I could teach them through devices and moderation and how to use technology appropriately to to resist temptation, then they'll be ready for the fiery darts that the adversary throws their way. I want to teach my kids to take care of their mind and their body. I want them to know what it means to take care of their outer man and their inner man, to make wise decisions related to sleep, related to their brain, and related to physical exercise and how they use their body outside and in the real world. I want to teach them to take care of their emotions. Emotions are a real thing. But emotions lie to us. Emotions don't have any brains. And emotions will continue to be affected by the things that we see on our screens. If I can teach my children to manage their emotions well through conversation about devices and screens, then I believe they will know how to glorify the Lord even more with their hearts. I can teach my kids how to gain and maintain meaningful, engaging relationships. I don't want my kids to walk around so fixed on their device that they don't know how to have a conversation with an adult or a friend or a peer. And I want to help them glorify God with the small decisions in their life. Christianity is a lot of small decisions of faithful obedience. If I can teach them to be obedient in the small things, then my hope is that I will raise them into adults that will glorify God for the whole of their life. Raising great adults is not the only goal of parenting. Raising kids that understand and know that their lives are meant to glorify God before they step into the real world, that's the goal of parenting. Next section, what should I do if my child has an addiction to screens and refuses help? This is a true story of a man who sat in my office seeking counseling, broken to pieces because he had just taken his son off to an in-home residency because of his screen time addiction. He sat in my office broken up because they had just had their seven-month visit with him. They checked him into a 12-month program in a boy's home because he was so addicted to screens. He wrote this letter to his son 
I'll change the name to protect him. Let's say it says Jason. He goes, Jason, how are you doing? At the seven-month visit, we enjoyed our time with you, talking with you, playing cards, watching Disney+, Plus, eating well, and relaxing at the hotel. In an effort to continue to develop our relationship with you and being real and genuine, we want to talk to you about something. We, can, we are concerned that you haven't admitted to yourself, let alone others, that your initial pornography and video game addiction was real. We hope that you've resolved and forgiven the reasons for the addiction and you have repented of your addiction. He goes on to list several different things that they saw. Listen to what he says later in a paragraph. He said, please understand, we witnessed all these symptoms of video game addiction, which was leading to your destruction. We discovered evidence that you were increasing week by week the number of hours of Xbox and gaming from 40 plus hours a week in September to 82 hours a week before you left. Other evidence of your addiction, you had complete isolation from us and your grandparents, you ditched classes, you were failing classes, you were fired from work, you were unable to focus on tasks, you were shaking and fidgety away when you were away from your gaming console, you were running to your room to game, you stopped attending church and youth group, isolation from past friendships, decline of grooming, weight loss of 10 pounds from doctor's visits, teachers expressing concerns with your behavior, options school counselors contacting us about your behavior, hearing from multiple people you intended to drop out of high school, and negative changes in your character and personality. At the doctor's visit, the doctor was about to admit you to the hospital for apparent psychological problems after a 15-minute checkup. This young boy, I think he was 17 at the time, had to move away from his parents and be admitted to a home because of a gaming addiction. The DSM, the Diagnostical Statistical Manual of Mental Illness, now says that video gaming addiction, among many other things, are real problems, psychological problems that our kids are facing. If your kid is in this place and refuses help, core principle number nine, we must realize that the addiction is serious. It's a clinically diagnosable condition and that it can have devastating effects if it is not addressed early, intentionally, and biblically. Let me be clear, all forms of addiction are problems. Anything we're addicted to is a problem. And according to the Neuro Health Association, there are various kinds of screen and tech dependencies that are emerging in this generation, including the gaming disorder. There is now a, a label for internet addiction. There is compulsive internet use addiction. As I mentioned, video gaming addiction, internet gaming addiction, social media addiction. These are all labels from the world saying that they are real problems. The term addiction is increasingly being used to describe the problematic behaviors in our kids. Your kids may have all sorts of addictions related to screens, and my hope is that you will do your best to break them as early as possible and not let them continue to go forward. Proverbs 25 verse 28 says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. That's our kids if they're addicted to screens. They're a city without walls, a city that's been broken into. And we must realize that we have to pull them away from that addiction and pursue Christ above all things. In my book, I talk about vinegar aber besser. It is a German term, which means less but better. It's important that our kids have less but better time with screens to avoid addiction. Four benefits of less but better that I put in the book, and you can find it there, expounded upon more. First is it supports their physical health if they have less time on their screens, but more concentrated time only on the better things. It will improve their social connections if they have a less but better mindset related to their technology. It will support their mental health and then it will give them the chance to learn new things. If they're only focused on learning technology and consuming screen time, you're keeping them away from some of these other benefits. And the addiction will rise, and it's a hard thing to break. Let me begin to wrap our time then with the only two rules you need. After all this that I've shared with you, I think there are only two rules you need related to screen time usage. I was sitting with uh, Pastor Ken Murphy and his wife, Laura, at Ted's Montana Grill for a, a date night with my wife. And we're talking about raising our kids. 
And Ken just blurted out, I only had two rules in my home. And I'm thinking, I have like 200 rules in my home. How did you only have ten or two? He had five kids, so he had two rules. I thought, two rules per kid? Is that, that what you had? No, no, two rules altogether. He had two rules. His two rules were, you must love Christ and you must love your neighbor more than yourself. I thought, that was it? That's it? And he said, yeah, that's the only rule in the Bible. And I kept teaching my kids that all the years that they were in my home. So I wrote it down. The two essential Christian household rules should simply be love Christ and love others. There might be need for other rules and other guidelines, but everything should come back to these two rules. Are you loving Christ and are you loving others? Another way to ask it is, does what you're about to do please Christ? Is it bringing Him glory? Is it bringing you to a place of loving Him more? Or is it pulling you away from Him? Does what you're about to do show love towards others? Or is it you loving yourself more than anything? If we're teaching our kids to love God, then we're teaching them the gospel. God so loved them that He gave His only Son for them. He redeemed them. If we're teaching them to respond to Him in His loving kindness, then they will make loving God first priority. Second priority will be loving others. And they'll make sure that in their life and even their screen time usage, they're not sacrificing the feelings of others for their own betterment or for their own self-glorification or for their own feelings, but rather they're doing everything they can to live selflessly for others, which is core principle number 10. And I'll leave you with this. Screens, like money or time, are amoral in nature. It's how we use these devices to fulfill the greatest commandment of Christ that matters the most. We should be using our screens as an opportunity to teach our kids the power of God's love for them and the need to live in response to His love. I gave you questions on page 99 of the book that can help you evaluate if you're living in balance and ultimately pointing your kids towards Christ in their use of screen time. But my hope is that you will continue to use screens as an opportunity not only to teach your kids the power of God's love for them, but the power of being on mission to love Him and to love others above all things. The only two rules you need to govern your house is to love Christ and love others. That's all Christ gave us, and that's how we should continue to live as well. Before I take any question and answer, let me just say this to you. You're not alone. You can look around a room like this and know there are other parents that are seeking to navigate these times just like you are. You're not alone. Christ will give you wisdom and you must lock arms with other parents, stand on the truth of God's word, have the cross and the gospel as your back, and you'll be able to navigate a device-saturated world as you parent your kids to glorify the Lord. So press on. You can do this. Are there any questions or comments that I can answer for you this evening? Things related to the material or other things. Yes. I had a question about a little more about the kind of coupon buyback program. Sure. Um, when you were giving that as a reward, mm -hmm. did you see other issues that came up with your kids trying to take advantage of additional time or like try to push boundaries further when using the technology as a reward? You know, I didn't. The only thing that I saw once was I kept the coupons in a jar in the corner cabinet. And somehow a couple of those coupons snuck out of that cabinet at one point. I don't know how that happened, but that was it. Other than like, as far as pushing the boundary, they didn't really do that. They understood. Listen, thanks. You just gave me that currency. And that, that was valuable to them. It was like a dollar bill or more, right? And so I would set the timer. And they knew when that went off. That, that, that they had used their currency. So I actually found that they respected it more. Now, one other principle is to give them fair warning. So, and I think this is good whether you use the print coupons or not, just to say, hey, listen, in five minutes, your screen's gonna be turned in, right? Wrap up what you're doing, wrap up the game, whatever. So giving them some fair warning that it's coming. So I would do my best to do that. And I just found that they really didn't push it. Uh, maybe, maybe we had some sneak away, but that's about it, so yeah. Yeah, good question. And the buyback program, you can come up with how they buy it back. For me, it was reading or, or extra homework. Their regular homework didn't count and regular chores didn't count. I would allow them to do chores that are not their regular chores in order to earn some kind of coupon back. So yeah, you can come up with what that is for you right now. Yes. Hi, Josh, my name is Brett. Brett, uh, thanks. Do you favor the use of an internet filtering 
software? And if yes. so, what would you recommend? Yeah, great. So I do favor the use of that. Um, the one that I've used the longest is Covenant Eyes, which gives a report from all the devices to whoever you choose that that report should go to. So that's a software, but just like any software or any filtering program, those things can be worked around, right? There are ways that they turn it off and then they can still get through things. Perhaps one of the greatest things I would recommend for your household is uh, a modem that would do the filtering for you. And if you go to a website called Protect Young Eyes, I recommend that website to all of you, but protectyoungeyes.com. Not only do they teach you about all sorts of apps, but they'll teach you about all sorts of technology as well. And there's different modems that they recommend there. So if you go to their menu and go to devices in their drop-down menu, they have the latest and greatest modems that you could put in your house that will not only help you set boundaries on time, you can do that with most modems these days where it shuts down at a certain time, but you can also put on certain filtering that certain sites can't be accessed. So I recommend a full house filtering um, rather than just accountability software, but something like Covenant Eyes is helpful as well. Uh, it doesn't work great on all devices, so that's why I'd rather use something uh, that, that, that kind of monitors the whole house. But obviously when they're not in your house, that doesn't help for that. So. But Protect Young Eyes has other recommendations as well. There's things like Bark um, and other apps that you can put on devices that will alert you if you're, that device is looking at things that you sh you, you've told it it shouldn't be looking at. For my own device, I'll just be vulnerable and tell you, my, my device has parent controls on it. Uh, my, my device. So I, there are sites I can't get to. My wife has the password, right? And it's annoying sometimes because I'm just trying to do something and all of a sudden I hit, oh, I can't even see that site. Come on, I need to get there for seminary, right? For seminary, I can't let me through. So she has to put in the passcode so I can go to those sites. But even for me, I have, I've used everything that my phone has as native to its uh, apps and to its software to help protect even me or my kids. And I recommend the same thing. Use what's native to your Android or your Apple device. So, yeah. Is that helpful? Good, yeah, for sure. And Protect Young Eyes goes through how to set some of that up. If you need help setting some of that up, a good Google search will help you on that. I mean, there's, there's a lot that'll help you set up all these parent controls, so, yep. Yes, just a couple more questions. Do you ever, have, do you ever find uh, a family movie night challenging because of the different ages of your children, some of your older kids being able to just mentally handle yep. longer periods of time, like you can handle a whole movie. Yeah. Where younger kids flip out. Oh, for sure. Right, and and how do you how do you go about that to have a, a nice family movie night? Yeah. And you got one kid that can probably only handle 30 minutes and one that can handle yep. an hour and a half to two hours, which is fine. Yeah, sure. So I, I um, first of all, with family movie nights, you always uh, pick a movie to the lowest common denominator in the room that will fit the, the lowest person. So we try our best to say, hey, this is best for this person to watch. So we just had a family movie night, watched Prince of Egypt, a 1998 film, but it worked. All of our kids could understand it. But it's okay to say, hey, there's going to be an intermission in this movie. And intermission, is everybody's going to stop and we're going to take a break and mom's going to take some kids upstairs and some are going to go to bed and, and we'll either clean up some things or pop some fresh popcorn, but we're probably not going to make it all the way through this movie without a stop. So announcing, hey, there will be an intermission, but, but that's because we're respecting the youngest member of the group. So, yeah. Yep. Well, with no further questions, let me pray for you and I'll send you on your way. Again, Protect Young Eyes is a great website for you to check out, but I also would recommend that you go by Raising Screen Time Kids. It is material there from the book, and there's things that will be released uh, in the future there, so hopefully that will be a future resource to you. And if you found this content helpful, please give it to other parents, not to propagate anything we're trying to do here or promote me or this content. We just want to help parents raise Christ-loving, Christ-exalting kids, and hopefully this book will do that. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to go through this material. We thank you even more so for your son, and we thank you for the gospel. We thank you that he has saved our soul, that he has redeemed us, and that in him we can find help and hope through all the hard things that we face, including parenting. Father, I pray for these parents, that you will give them wisdom, whether they're parenting a small child or a teen. Lord, I pray that you will help them know how to navigate what they need to navigate as they help their uh, either young, young child or now on the cusp of an adult child make wise decisions. Please help them. I, hope, I pray that you'll help all of us glorify you in the small areas of our life, even what we view on our devices. Will you help us please be people of purity, 
We hope to set an example in speech and life and love related to how we use our technology. And Lord, be glorified, please, in the way that we use the things in this world to advance your gospel. And may we continue to proclaim you until you return again. We love you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us.